August 9, presidential elections in Belarus were in the focus of experts and mass media long before the election date. Several factors have contributed to the widespread perception that this time things will turn out differently and long-time leader Alexander Lukashenko will face tough challenges both prior and after the elections. Interestingly, the most discussed scenario before the elections was not the US and EU efforts to topple the last dictator of Europe, but the high probability of Russia-initiated color revolution to either force President Lukashenko out or significantly weaken him, to derail the normalization process with the EU and the US, and to make Lukashenko more flexible in the negotiations with Russia on the establishment of the Union state. Lukashenko seemed to perceive Russian threats rather seriously. He made significant steps to increase contacts with the West. In early February, he met with the U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo in Minsk. Mr. Pompeo promised full U.S. support for Belarus sovereignty and hinted that the U.S. will assist Belarus to overcome its dependence over Russian oil and gas supply. Belarusian Central Election Committee did not register Russia-connected candidates Viktor Babariko and Valery Tsepkala as presidential candidate. The only serious opposition candidate who was allowed to participate in the elections was Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, the wife of the arrested opposition blogger Sergei Tsikhanovsky. Thus, it seemed that presidential Lukashenko effectively had thwarted Russian plots to destabilize the situation in Belarus and had all the chances to quietly win his sixth presidential term. However, immediately after the closure of election precincts in the evening of August 9, widespread protests erupted in many cities of Belarus. It's difficult to assess the real scope of external actors' actions in Belarus. However, presumably two parallel and very similar processes have been underway in Belarus, initiated by Russia and some circles in the West. Both sought to destabilize the situation in Belarus prior and after the elections, but with different goals. Russia's immediate goals were to stop the further normalization of relations between Belarus and the West, to weaken Lukashenko and to initiate power transition from him to a more Russia-friendly person. Some circles in the West hoped that Lukashenko's full attention was focused on Russian threats and this might help them to organize a blitzkrieg and force him out as a result of a strong protest movement. However, as for now, events have been developing mainly by Russian scenario. President Lukashenko had several phone conversations with President Putin and stated that in case of external military threats, Russia would be ready to provide support to Belarus. Meanwhile, several groups of Russian consultants have arrived in Belarus and have been embedded within Belarusian state institutions increasing Russian influence over Minsk. Key European players, including leaders of Germany and France, have discussed the situation in Belarus with President Putin and emphasized the necessity to solve the crisis through intensive nationwide dialogue. This may provide Russia an opportunity to implement its plan of power transition from Lukashenko with EU support by initiating and effectively controlling dialogue between Lukashenko and opposition. Hello to everyone. This is a new episode of Crossroad at CUNET, and today we will discuss the post-election crisis in Belarus, and our guest will be Belarusian expert Arsen Sivitsky, the director at the Center of Strategic and Foreign Policy Studies. Arsen, hello and thanks for accepting our invitation. Uh, hello, Benjamin. Thank you for your invitation. Arsene, events in Belarus are in the focus of world media and also expert community. All are discussing what is happening in Belarus, but the uh, key issue is why is happening, what is happening. Uh, several uh, experts uh, believe that in Belarus, prior to August 9 elections, there were two parallel processes, one led by Russia, and one led by Poland and Baltic states, especially Lithuania. And both these processes, their target was to organize some type of color revolution using the presidential elections. And Russian aim was to strategically weaken Lukashenko, maybe to force him to accept these integration offers, which was made during December 2019 in between President Lukashenko and President Putin. While Poland and Baltic states, they were keen to bring uh, some pro-Western or pro-Polish uh, people in Belarus. 
And according to this uh, version of events, the Russian authorities paid much attention to prevent uh, any possible negative development from the Russian side. We here may mention the arrest of one of the key candidates, Viktor Babariko, who was the director of the Belarus Gazprom Bank, and then also arrest of the 32 or 33 mercenaries of Wagner Group. And thus, uh, President Lukashenko was quite sure uh, that uh, elections and after election processes will be uh, rather quiet because he managed uh, to prevent Russian uh, threat. But he missed, or he missed the processes organized by Poland and Baltic states. What are your thoughts? Do you agree or do you have your own version? Um, so, um, yes, I can agree with some of your points, especially related to the Russia's interference in the domestic affairs uh, of Belarus before the presidential elections. However, uh, I can't agree uh, with you about the role of the Western countries, in, in particular um, Baltic states and Poland. Um, so probably I will start with this issue and then uh, come back to the Russia factor in the uh, election and post-election dynamics. Uh, first of all, um, so the Baltic states, uh, Poland, as well as other Western countries, first of all, the United States and the European Union in general uh, took a position of uh, a neutral observer uh, during the uh, presidential election campaign. There were no uh, any representatives of the pro-Western uh, political forces from the traditional uh, opposition during this uh, election campaign uh, in comparison to the previous elections, uh, for instance, in 2015 or in, 20, or, uh, in 2010, as well as in 26. Um, and uh, as we have uh, we, we saw during uh, last years, uh, Belarus was quite active in normalizing relations with the European Union and the United States. Um, and uh, uh, this normalization uh, became uh, a result of uh, a new geopolitical environment. Uh, in the region uh, determined by the Russia-Ukraine conflict of 2014 and uh, actually Belarus uh, was recognized uh, by the Western uh, countries uh, as a, a security and stability uh, provider in the region uh, and Lukashenko actually guaranteed the so-called security uh, or provided the so-called uh, security guarantees to the neighboring countries, including Baltic states and Ukraine, that he would not allow uh, the Russian Federation to use the territory of Belarus in order to commit military aggression uh, against these states. And that is how Lukashenko uh, got his uh, legitimacy on the international scene, uh, especially in the eyes of the Western countries, in particular the Baltic states and Poland, uh, that were advocating stronger uh, ties uh, in different spheres uh, with Belarus. Uh, so uh, my argument is that uh, the West uh, was actually supporting Alexander Lukashenko behind the scenes during this election campaign. That is Western capitals didn't provide any significant uh, 
financial assistance to, to, to their uh, traditional uh, partners uh, in the Belarusian opposition. Uh, the, the one of the reasons why the West uh, was not interesting in exporting the color revolution in Belarus this time, uh, because they, uh, the Western politicians uh, understand that uh, any attempt uh, of launching a uh, West-led a color revolution or a regime change will automatically trigger Russian military intervention. Uh, so, um, and uh, even during the normalization process, we saw that the Western capitals um, were trying to take into consideration these red lines imposed by the Kremlin for for Belarus and uh, were less active in the normalization process than uh, their Belarusian counterparts. Um, so uh, my point is that the Russia's involvement was much more proactive uh, in the election campaign than the engagement of the West, uh, which I can describe or characterize uh, as a neutral position. And uh, from this perspective, we can also assume that uh, the West was ready to uh, recognize the victory of uh, Alexander Lukashenko uh, the victory of Alexander Lukashenko. Uh, however, uh, then uh, after the voting day on the 9th of August, the brutal and bloody crackdown uh, happened uh, that actually uh, spoiled all the progress in the normalization of relations with the West and lead and led to a very top position uh, of the European Union, uh, the United States and the United Kingdom uh, regarding okay. the post elections situation in Belarus. Uh, thank you very much. You mentioned that you don't believe that uh, West in general or Poland and Baltic states in particular, they had major involvements in the event prior to the August 9th. Uh, but when uh, we look what happened after August 9th, these large scale protests, especially during the first days when there were a violent and bloody um, clashes with riot police, and then we had seen the big demonstration on August 16 and then on August 23. Uh, all these demonstrations, mainly, they were organized by one or two telegram channels. And the biggest one was the Nexta or Nexta Live. And according to several information, this telegram channel is uh, based in Poland. And uh, so the speculation goes that if uh, the editors of this telegram channel are behind these protests, they are really organizing through sending some instructions to protesters. How can we exclude that these guys, with, about whom we have very little information, that uh, these potential editors and coordinators, they do not have any connection with Polish state? And also, why the two uh, the key candidates, the Pana Tichanowskaya, left Belarus to Lithuania, I believe three days after the election, and uh, till now she is there, she met with Deputy Secretary of State of the United States, made several high-level calls, also is going to address United Nations Security Council or General Assembly in several days. And another candidate, which was denied access to elections, Mr. Tsepkalo, he also with his family now in Poland. So we see that at least two of these three candidates, and Mr. Babarikov still in jail in Belarus, one is Lithuania and the second is in Poland, which we may say they are more of Russian state within the European Union. 
So these two candidates, one in Poland, another in Lithuania, and protests are being organized by Telegram channel, whose editors, so people behind this Telegram channel, are, are based in Poland. So can we say that at least if there was no active involvement of the West or of the Eastern European countries in the event in Belarus prior to August 9, can we say that at least after August 9, the situation has been changed? And at least after August 9, we saw the usual picture of Eastern European, some countries triggering the revolution in one of the post-Soviet states under Russian, within Russian influence, while Kremlin seeking to prevent this through several means. Um, so let's start from the Russia factor. Uh, from the very beginning of the presidential campaign uh, in Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko was ex accusing um, all his main competitors, including uh, Sergei Tsikhanovsky, who was detained, uh, and then uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovsky, uh, his spouse, uh, entered the election campaign. Then Valery Tsipkala and uh, Viktor Babarika in uh, direct or in direct connections with the Kremlin. So it was an official position articulated by the Belarusian uh, uh, even security uh, apparatus. Uh, and um, there were no doubts uh, why Lukashenko uh, decided to eliminate uh, these figures from the game, uh, not due to the, their uh, uh, activities or not due to their popularity, but first of all because Lukashenko understood that the Kremlin was behind this uh, political projects. Um, however, the discourse, the official discourse uh, changed uh, considerably after the elections uh, of the 9th of August and uh, Lukashenko started to blame the West uh, for the interference in domestic affairs. So uh, I believe the real reason is purely ideological and uh, Lukashenko is understanding that uh, the Kremlin has managed uh, uh, to make Lukashenko's position weaker with the help of actually provoking all, all this protest moods and sentiments by supporting um, candidates from the new opposition, I mean the Svet uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, Valery Tsipkala and Viktor Babarika. And now uh, Lukashenko has to balance the, the uh, situation in relations with the West. So he is trying to please the Kremlin with his traditional uh loyal uh, uh, Kremlin uh, but uh, nevertheless uh, I believe that after the situation is uh, stabilized in Belarus so uh, especially after upcoming um, meetings with the Russian officials including um, the meeting of Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko that will take place in two weeks. So the rhetorics, uh, official rhetorics can change its vector and become uh, anti-Russian uh, as we have seen it before. Uh, one of the reasons uh, is that Russia is continuing to uh, put uh, political pressure upon Alexander Lukashenko, uh, shaping the environment, internal environment in Belarus, that will facilitate the so-called 
uh, transfer of power through the constitutional uh, change. Uh, when it comes to the Western response or reaction to the developments on the uh, 9th of August, it was uh, quite evident that the Western capitals would react in such manner according to the value-based uh, approach. Uh, and um, uh, so the main reason uh, why Svetlana Tikhanovska and uh, Valery Tsipkala decided to leave uh, the territory of Belarus because they could be simply detained by the Belarusian authorities. And by the way, Valery Tsipkala uh, uh, first arrived in Moscow, uh, where he announced the creation of the so-called National Salvation Committee. Uh, and only a few weeks after, he decided to move to Ukraine, where he stays till today. Um, so I would say that we don't need to follow the actual location of those of the politicians. So we should to take into consideration uh, all their links and connections that we have been previously observing during the election campaign. Uh, and um, when it comes to the next uh, Telegram channel, which has uh, a, repu a reputation of this uh, coordination note uh, of the Belarusian protests, uh, I would suggest also not to make uh, such strong uh, uh, assessments uh, of his affiliation with the Polish government or Polish security services, because first of all, we know only that the leader of this uh, telegram channel stays in Poland. Uh, but there is no technical uh, and other means to intercept his connections with uh, the team uh, of editors of this Telegram channel. So uh, we don't know where the other uh, member of his team are located today uh, because the Telegram channel is a de decentralized uh, platform. Uh, so you can actually coordinate these protests uh, staying in different parts of the world and it actually doesn't matter uh, or your location doesn't really matter uh, when it comes to the coordination because we are speaking about the networked society. Uh, so, uh, uh, but Belarusian officials, at least at their uh, official rhetorics, are uh, accusing uh, the Telegram channel in connections with the uh, Polish government and even the Polish security services. But frankly speaking, judging by the, uh, the content of the Telegram channel, judging by the fact that uh, it is a Russian language Telegram channel, not the Belarusian language uh, Telegram channel, which uh, is usually associated with the Belarusian traditional opposition. Uh, I can't exclude that it could be a false flag operation, uh, also uh, initiated and coordinated by, by, by the Russian side. Uh, because, frankly speaking, I don't see any real capabilities of Poland or, or uh, the Baltic states uh, to launch uh, the regime change 
in Belarus or uh, to provoke a color revolution with the very unexpected consequences. Uh, at least one of them we know exactly uh, that Russia will interfere and not only politically but also militarily. I don't I don't think so that uh, the Western politicians don't take into consideration uh, this uh, strategic calculations. Arseniy, thank you very much. A really interesting discussion. Uh, let's now speak about the future of Belarus. Uh, first of all, all experts, Belarusian, Western, Russian, agree that now Russia, we may say, is a kingmaker in Belarus. So almost everything depends on the Russian will. And also, we hear many statements from Russian officials that the only way to overcome this crisis in Belarus is to launch the constitutional amendment process. And President Lukashenko also speaks a lot about this issue, telling that yes, I am ready to launch the constitutional amendment process. So, first of all, let's understand what does this mean, uh, how long it may take, and what Belarus we will have under the new constitution. Will it be a semi-presidential republic? Will it be a parliamentary republic? And also, what do you think? What plans has uh, Russia? Does Russia still view uh, Mr. Lukashenko as a key player in the future politics of Belarus? Maybe as a president with reduced authorities? Or maybe as a prime minister, if Belarus will be transformed into the parliamentary republic? Thank you, Benjamin, for your question. Um, so uh, let's start from the um, uh, issue of the uh, constitutional reform. Actually, first rumors about the constitutional reform uh, appeared already in 20. Uh, and uh, so a few years ago, Lukashenko uh, repeated uh, his intention to uh, launch this process. Uh, and according to some his statements, um, this constitution uh, envisages, uh, this constitution reform uh, envisages uh, sharing uh, his power with uh, the parliament with the prime minister, uh, so facilitating the formation of, of the party system, uh, some elements of the decentralization, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we actually don't know exactly about the parameters uh, and modalities uh, of this constitution uh, reform. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, we can uh, judge uh, on the uh, about the uh, Belarusian leadership's uh, intentions. Uh, only uh, by this some uh, comments and statements in the mass media, uh, and still uh, it doesn't address the core issues like uh, you know uh, the model uh, of the political system the issue of the social economic uh, model or the social contract. Uh, so uh, what will be the uh, exact division of powers and so on and so forth. Uh, but what we can exactly say uh, that of course uh, Russia will try to interfere in this process and uh, guide it according to its national interests. Uh, actually, Russia has successfully uh, secured its positions uh, in Belarus uh, after the 9th of August, after the presidential elections. 
by sending uh, a clear uh, message to the Western countries that if they are going somehow uh, to interfere in the process or to spoil the Kremlin's game in Belarus, it will lead to the Russian military intervention. So Putin, Vladimir Putin, Russia president, has stated uh, and repeated this message several times. And uh, actually, uh, from this perspective, we can say that the Kremlin has managed to deploy a political analog of the uh, anti-excess aerial denial zone uh, in, Very interesting in, 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 in Belarus. <laughs> yeah, and uh, in these terms, so West now uh, has to take into consideration the Kremlin's strategic interests and intentions in Belarus, and if the West would like to deal uh, with the Belarus issue, First of all, Western diplomats uh, have to call to Mr. Putin or Mr. Lavrov. So uh, these uh, communications we have been observing since uh, almost the next day uh, after the elections. Um, and uh, the process of behind the scenes uh, consultations between the Kremlin and the Paris, Berlin, and even Washington uh, is going on on now. Uh, so, what are the aims uh, and strategic goals of the Russian Federation uh, when it comes to this constitutional reform, uh, which is uh, seen by the Kremlin as a way to uh, uh, solve? the ongoing political crisis in Belarus. So first of all, uh, uh, this is my uh, assessment, they would like uh, to transform the political system of Belarus from this uh, super presidential uh, state to the semi uh, presidential or even parliamentarian republic. And uh, from, from this perspective, um, they, it will uh, allow them to have much more leverages upon the political process in Belarus, especially if they are going to uh, configure uh, a new uh, uh, political space of Belarus in the upcoming months and years. I mean, creating some uh, puppet political parties uh, that uh, respect that respect the um, uh, Russian strategic interests in 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 Belarus and uh, provide the guarantees that the Russian uh, that Belarus will not uh, reconsider its geopolitical course. Um, so uh, providing or demonstrating its commitments to the alliances with the, with the, with the Russian Federation. And actually, if Russia is uh, able to uh, keep under the control the constitutional uh, reform uh, process, uh, it will lead to the uh, export of so-called uh, managed democracy from a model from Russia to Belarus, which in some terms can be compared with the uh, model of uh, color revolution backed by, by the Russian Federation. But uh, in any case, it will lead uh, to the significant decrease uh, of Alexander Lukashenko's power and influence in Belarus, uh, because um, these strong authoritarian leaders uh, uh, 
are considered by uh, some Kremlin strategists um, as uh, barriers and obstacles in promoting Russian strategic interests on the post-Soviet space rather than uh, a negotiable uh, allies. Uh, what we have been seeing uh, since the 2015 that Lukashenko uh, has been completely opposing to the Russian strategic interests in the Western strategic direction. So he actually has been containing uh, Russia's strategic uh, plans in these regions by not allowing Russia to deploy uh, military bases uh, on the territory of Belarus by opposing to the so-called Armenization of the national security sector of Belarus and the subordination of the uh, joint uh, military components to the uh, command of the Western military uh, district, uh, deploying the military base or uh, formation of joint uh, border guard uh, uh, units um, on the Western border uh, of Belarus, and so on and so forth. Uh, and finally, he has rejected the so-called uh, integration ultimatum formulated by uh, Russian leadership uh, at the end of 2018. So from this perspective, uh, I would say that Russia is seeking options to withdraw uh, Alexander Lukashenko uh, uh, from the political scene and to limit his political influence and power. Okay. Thank you, Arsani, for your thoughts. It was a really interesting uh, discussion. Thank you for accepting and thank you for your time. And I would like to remind uh, to TVNet uh, audience that today at the crossroad we discussed external factors in post-election crisis in Belarus. And our guest was Arsani Filitsky, Director of the Center for Strategic and Foreign Policy Studies based in Minsk. And then I also would like to thank Freedom at the Foundation for their support to our program. Thank you. Bye and we will be. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin.